Today we'll put the Solus on Dyne Legions under the microscope and talk about the strengths and weaknesses for every unit in the Necron Codex. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focus 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. In today's video we're doing another mammoth project, in one video talking through every single Necron unit, their good and bad points, and giving them a very rough score out of 10 from roughly how competitive I think they are. We'll be moving at a fairly swift pace as of course we have tons of units to get through. These big codex reviews are a lot of effort for me, so if you enjoy this sort of content hit the like button and maybe let me know which ones you'd like to see next. In any case let's jump straight in then and we'll start our journey with the troops. So first up we have the Heart of the Legions, the Necron Warriors, a 13 points troop choice and we're off to a good start as of an absolutely amazing unit. Perhaps the single best thing about these guys is their extraordinary resilience, in big blocks of 20 they've got their 4 plus armor save, toughness 4, 5 plus reanimation protocol roll and you can also stack it with all sorts of other defensive buffs. Really handy when you also have obsec as well and it means they're going to be a nightmare to remove from objectives. As perhaps the single most core unit of the codex, warriors have access to an absolute myriad of buffs, a 5 plus involved from the chronomancer, technomancer's rights of reanimation to stand a few back up, the ghost arc repairing them and transporting them, overlords giving my will be done plus resurrection orbs, and the royal warden also helps out with them very well as well as when they get tagged in combat they can drop back and still shoot. With just how tough they are they're usually going to cause at least some sort of problem for your opponents, and what's more they can also be reasonably good at damage dealing as well, taking that close range high strength gauss reaper and getting them into position either by using the veil of darkness or a ghost arc. Perhaps their biggest weakness is, is that they're relatively slow and a little bit mediocre in melee, who even this can be kind of okay if you put them in Novok and combine their dynastic code with their stratagem. They're also a bit short ranged in terms of doing any real damage, so they're only going to be all that effective within 12 inches. In any case though, neither of those are massively important to them, they mainly just need to be incredibly durable and get on objectives, and with all the synergies and options they have, I would give them a full 10 out of 10. They're an absolutely great troops choice. Moving on, we come to the Immortals, who are 17 to 19 points per model, depending on which gun you'd like, and if you directly compare them to Warriors, for the actual points that you invest, they're actually really quite similar in terms of abilities. They've got good resilience again, plus obsec, they cost more but have a better save and better toughness, and can profit from quite a lot of the buffs that Warriors can as well. I'd say for battlefield role, I'd say they're a bit more suited to camping home field objectives, rather than pushing up into the center. Compared with Warriors, their shooting at longer range is quite a lot more effective. Additionally, they can be pretty handy for camping home objectives, as they're available in smaller squads, you only need to spend 85 points on a unit of Immortals, which might get the job done just as well as a much bigger unit of Warriors. For major downsides, they can't use the Ghost Arc, and their melee is still quite mediocre, even though they have two attacks. I would rank them a tiny bit lower than Warriors at 9 out of 10, mainly because you can't get the really big units of them of 20 strong, which really allows you to concentrate loads of bodies for some powerful Necron buffs. In general, the Warriors seem to see a little bit more tournament play than these guys. I thought we'd look at the transport choice next, the Ghost Arc, seeing as it does heavily relate to the Warriors. Ghost Arcs are 145 points per model, and for that you get a pretty durable transport with quantum shielding for the 5 plus invul save and only being able to be wounded on a 4 plus, transport capacity for 10 Warriors, and some actually genuinely quite impressive close range anti-infantry fire with 20 gauss flare shots within 12 inches. As I mentioned already, he works quite well with warriors armed with gauss reapers, allowing them to get in range, and just generally stack a whole load of anti-infantry firepower on anything in the midfield. Again, venturing forwards, they are a little bit liable to being tagged in melee, they can shoot in close combat, but that will lock out the rest of your army from targeting that same unit, and quite apart from gameplay, they are quite an annoying model to build and put together. Generally though, again I found the Ghost Arcs to be pretty excellent, certainly a competitive Necron choice combined with those Warriors, I'd score them a 9 out of 10. Moving on, I thought we'd do the Elite section next. We'll start out with the Canoptic Reanimator, now an 80 points Elite's choice, it was heavily discounted for when it first came out in Indomitus. The Reanimator makes one Necron unit reanimate on a 4+, which is actually a genuinely quite good buff, but the problem is that the reanimator is just incredibly fragile to enemy shooting and you really need to be able to hide it otherwise it's just going to get shot first. It's a little bit tricky as it needs to be sort of near a Necron unit but also needs to be out of line of sight of the enemies otherwise it's going to be very easy to gun down. It does have a tiny bit of melee and close range firepower itself though obviously that's not its main purpose. I think it's quite close to being really quite usable indeed, but at this point's cost I'd still say that it's too fragile for competitive use for the most part. I've ranked it a 5 out of 10. 
could probably use just being a bit cheaper and then I'm sure to see a lot more play. With the big points cut that it got though, I think it is already significantly better than when it first came out, which is why I haven't ranked it any lower. Next up we have the Canoptic Spiders, between 60 to 80 points per model, depending on what upgrades you give them. The spiders seem fairly generalist to me, they've got okay melee damage, and they can be upgraded to have some fairly scary range damage as well with those particle beamers. Getting an extra 12 shots per model for just 10 points more is no small deal. They can also bear gloom prisms for some very cheap psychic denial for 5 points, and combine well with scarab swarms where they can heal a base per turn, and potentially get you quite a lot more units of scarabs on the board over the course of a whole game. Generally I do really quite like spiders, they're a quite good general utility model. The main downside is that again they're just a little bit on the fragile side for the cost, and kind of struggle to compete with other damage dealers within the codex. I'd say they're an okay but not standout unit to put in the battle line, I've scored them 7 out of 10, though I could easily be tempted to give them an 8 if I was feeling generous. Next we come to the Cryptothrows, the Cryptek Guard murder buckets, that are actually far more dangerous than I thought they would be judging by the appearance of the models. They're 20 points each, you get two of them to go alongside a Cryptek, and they are quite a good utility unit for the Necrons. First of all, they're a really cheap infantry unit, so they can be good for doing actions, jumping in table quarters or onto objectives, and provided they're somewhat near to a Cryptek, the melee damage that they put out is really quite good for the points. 6 strength 5 attacks at AP-1 is going to be felt by virtually anything. On top of that, they also have a small ranged attack as well, their bodyguard ability to protect characters, and are even fairly tough for the points as well, at toughness 5 and 2 wounds. I guess their main weakness is that they're nowhere near as functional if they're not near a Cryptek, and Cryptek's don't really want to be in melee, and it means that the whole formation has a sort of a mixed agenda. Also, only being able to get a small unit can be a weakness for melee squads, as it does give them the chance of just charging into an enemy unit, and then just getting killed back in return, as two models is rarely going to be enough to take out an enemy melee threat. Despite this though, I think that Cryptothrows are pretty excellent, what you get for what you invest is good, and I'll rate them a 9 out of 10. Next up we have the Hunters from Hyperspace in the Death Marks. They're an elite's choice at 18 points per model, and obviously they're going to be trying to fill the sniper role for the Necron army. The good news is that they will at least reliably stack some wounds on enemy characters. They are strength 5, AP-2, and also hit on 2 pluses, so they will stack at least a few wounds on enemy characters. With fairly good range, they can be kind of good for objective campus as well. If your opponent's looking like they're going to be using a fragile deep striking unit, you could potentially use etheric interception to try and jump down and kill them before they get to attack, but they do have to get kind of close for this, and they will be counted as moving as they have heavy weapons. For me, Deathmarks are one of the units that nearly get there, but I just feel like their points and damage output just don't quite get them over the mark. You would need quite a lot of them to reliably kill a character in a turn, and their damage output just really isn't all that good against anything that isn't a character. Overall, I've chosen to rate them a 6 out of 10, not terribly unusable, but I think that the drop of a point or two could really help them out. Next we have the Murderous Flayed Ones, an elite's choice for 13 points per model, and essentially a melee Necron Warrior with a bucket load of AP-1 attacks. They get exploding sixes against non-vehicle targets, have some innate deep strike if you want to set them up in reserve, are quite nice in that they have very similar durability to Necron Warriors, and also can be taken in really large units, so you can get the most out of buffs such as say the 5 plus Invul from the Chronomancer, and they're also a unit that will really thank you for being Novok, getting the extra AP-1, and charging in just that little bit easier. On the downside, when comparing with Warriors, you don't get any Obsec, unless you take it out of one of those Custom Dynasties or Nefrek. If they are doing their Deep Strike maneuver, they can be a bit unreliable. An 8-inch charge with a reroll will get you in combat more times than not, but sometimes they will just be sat there and then have to take the brunt of an enemy shooting face. Also, for close combat units, they're not desperately general purpose. They're really quite potent against infantry and squishy targets, but they'll struggle against anything with really high armor saves and toughness. That can be just a little bit problematic in an assault unit, as you might have a bit less choice as to what they go into. Overall, I've chosen to score them an 8 out of 10. A very solid Necron unit can most certainly be used competitively, just maybe a little bit more niche in application than more general purpose things like Warriors. Next up, we come to one of the more maligned choices of the Necron list, the slightly underwhelming Hexmark Destroyer with the 6 pistols. He's an elite's choice character for 75 points, and packs some very accurate, though not particularly potent pistols, where you get extra shots if you kill models, making him quite good against hordes. Really though, I'd argue that his damage output maybe isn't actually the most important thing with him. It's nice to have, but perhaps his biggest value is being a model that provides command protocols and can innately deep strike. You could pop this guy up alongside a unit of flayed ones, give them more command protocols, and still blaze away with his pistols, maybe relatively screened because he's next to a unit. 
Otherwise, he's potentially a good choice for the Gauntlet of the Conflagrator, that relic that can pack a bit of mortal wound punch against big hordes. He has the option to overwatch on a 2 plus if you spend the command point, so it could be a bit riskier to charge for light hordes. And like the death marks, he can also do etheric interception, potentially popping up to melt an enemy light infantry squad if a proper target presents itself. The obvious downside is that his damage is really quite bad against anything that's heavy or even just has a good armor save. And even if it's against his absolute optimal targets, he'll usually need multiple rounds of shooting just to justify his existence in the list if you're going purely from damage dealing. His survivability is not too bad for a character, but not great compared with normal units, so he does need screening, and that again makes him a bit more dependent on other units. Overall, I have chosen to rate him a 6 out of 10. I honestly don't think that this guy is utterly unusable, and while his shooting is very underwhelming, he could sometimes find himself a place in Necron lists. Next up, we come to the Lich Guard, a 28 points per model elite's choice, and a very hefty core unit. You have the choice of being incredibly hardy and difficult to remove with their dispersion shields, or incredibly destructive with their war scythes. Competitively, it seems that most people favour the sword and shield over the scythe. Even with the hyperphase swords though, they're still very threatening indeed. 3 strength 6 and AP minus 3 attacks is nothing to sniff at, and because they're just a massive tanky and destructive threat, they can be another great core unit for buffs of all sorts, whether that's damage dealing or durability. They're perhaps a particularly good synergy with the Necron Overlord, he can make them a 2 plus to hit with My Will Be Done, they can act as a bodyguard for him with their guardian protocols, and they have a stratagem that gets an extra attack when they're near a character, making them even more deadly still. Generally their main point is that you're investing quite a lot of points in the unit at 28 points each, and for melee troops they are kind of slow. Still though, with just how tough they are combined with Necron reanimations and things, a block of Lich Guard with an Overlord marching down the centre of the field is likely to cause problems. Definitely a competitive unit, I rated them 9 out of 10. Moving on to another set of Elite Shock Assault troops, we have the Scorpec Destroyers. These poster boys of Necrons in 9th edition are 35 points per model, and the sturdy Toughness 5 constructions with 3 wounds and attack with all manner of powerful power blades. They're just quite good all-rounders for melee troops, fairly fast, okay toughness, and very destructive in melee, and they can access a few destroyer synergies, such as re-rolls from the Scorpec Lords. Perhaps one of their best assets is the Whirling Onslaught Stratagem, just 1 CP for having a minus 1 to wound on them will make them a lot tougher than they really should be, and helps incentivize taking a really big squad. As for downsides, they aren't core, so don't get quite as many staggering buffs as things like Lich Guard might be able to, and without an invul save, things with decent AP will get to work on them quite quickly, even with Whirling Onslaught active. Still though, remain a decent option for a Necron Assault unit, certainly very playable and usable in strong lists, I've chosen to rate them an 8 out of 10 here. Often seen following along behind the Scorpex, we have the Canoptic Plasma Site next, technically its own data sheet, a little 15 point model that can get plus 1 strength and attack when next to the destroyer unit, at the risk of killing a model on a 1 in 6 chance. Basically this guy's a cheap damage upgrade on the unit, and really can help push their attacks to the next level. Really though, it doesn't do all that much more than this, it disappears if there's no destroyer models anywhere nearby, it's easy to kill if it gets nearest to the enemy. It doesn't have any actions, and it does have that 1 in 6 chance of killing a destroyer when it provides its buff. Overall, I've chosen to rate the Plasma Site 7 out of 10. Obviously, you're only going to be taking it if you're taking Scorpec or Ophidian Destroyers, and even if you are taking them, I could see times when you might not want to make the investment, say if you're running a small unit. For that reason, I'd say that it's probably a good idea whenever you're fielding 5 or more, but typically not worth the effort for smaller units. Next up we come to the Triarch Stalker, an Elite's Choice vehicle that's 135 to 150 points depending on what guns you give it. The Stalker's basically a shooting platform that gives buffs. If it hits the enemy with its shooting attack, then the rest of the army will all get reroll ones to hit against that target. Its range damage isn't massively outstanding in itself, so really to justify it, you do need to be in a fairly heavy shooting list, where multiple units are going to be making use of that reroll ones to hit. If you are playing a shooting heavy Necron list, perhaps Mephrit or something, it could potentially be worth it, as if you're focusing down an enemy unit, you could get a big buff to quite a lot of units across your force. In addition, it can give you a small amount of melee damage with those four limbs, but not absolutely loads, and it is fairly sturdy with quantum shielding. Other than what we've already mentioned, I would say that it will be less useful against any enemies that use multiple small units, as opposed to a few big ones. A reroll ones buff isn't going to be much use if you have to target chaff infantry with it, and they maybe just die to the first round of firepower anyway. I would also bear in mind that it's not going to get any dynastic codes either, as of course it's a dynastic agent. Overall, I've chosen to rank it a 7 out of 10, 
could be a good fit if you've got quite a lot of shooting, otherwise probably not worth bothering in favour of more direct firepower units. Finally for the elite slots we come to the Catan. All of these are quite expensive models, the Deceiver here is 350. They're elite's choice characters that can always be targeted, they can't make use of lookouts though, they throw around mortal wounds with their powers of the Catan, and they can be quite a problem for the enemy army to deal with, as their Necrodermis prevents them from losing any more than 3 wounds in any one phase. It means that you can't actually kill a Catan with just shooting, unless you're willing to put 4 turns effort into it. Out of the Catan, I must admit the Deceiver is one of the ones that I like the least to be honest. His damage output is far weaker than the others, and that's really not a good thing for a massive 350 point model. One of the main reasons to take him though is his Grand Illusion, which allows you to redeploy certain units or put them in strategic reserve, which I do appreciate is quite a handy power to have, but it is painful on losing out on the massive damage output that you could get by taking other options. In addition, the Deceiver also gets a minus one to hit as well. Overall, I don't really think he's much worse than the other Catan, but I just think that you run the risk of him just being completely ignored throughout the game, and your opponent can just focus on the rest of the Necron army list, not having to worry about this guy quite as much as if he were one of the other options. I chose to rate him a 7 out of 10, and maybe could be persuaded to put him up to an 8 perhaps. I do know how important pre-game deployment shenanigans like this could be, but 350 points is a big price to pay for a slightly underwhelming Catan model. Moving on to his bigger brother, the Nightbringer, 370 points, but this guy really is a model to strike fear into your opponent's army. He's one of the few models in 40k that really will kill almost anything it gets into in melee. Those brutal side attacks ignore invul saves, ignore feel no pain, and ignore rules that limit the amount of wounds that you can take, so oddly enough he's really good at killing other Catan. It even has an anti-horde mode as well, meaning that no matter what this thing catches, they are really going to feel it. Otherwise he has all the useful Catan things, Necrodermis and Living Metal. And for his Catan powers, the gaze of death that the Nightbringer gets as his unique one is particularly potent. The main downside is that he is the priciest of the Catan, 370 points is no joke, and I feel like the Nightbringer might be a model that's a bit more successful against players who aren't quite as good at the game, compared with the best of the best. I think that maybe at higher levels of play, stronger players might be able to handle that Necrodermis a bit better, maybe coordinating between shooting and then finishing him off in assault perhaps. Still though, there are a few models that will cause quite so much fear in your opponent's army and really force them to play around him. I have rated this guy a full 10 out of 10, perhaps he is a little bit overhyped, but often he's going to be absolutely game winning if he gets into the right targets. Next up we have the Catan Shard of the Void Dragon, this one 350 points, and maybe a bit more of a strong balanced Catan as opposed to just being an absolute melee monster like the Nightbringer. His melee is significantly stronger than the Deceivers and the Transcendent Catans though, particularly powerful against vehicles which he'll rip to shreds, and he can also heal himself a little bit when he damages vehicles, which synergizes with his Necrodermis pretty well. Otherwise, he's also got a 3 plus armor save, so he's a little bit less vulnerable to small arms than some of the others. Generally, I think that he's maybe not quite on the same level as the Nightbringer, maybe not quite as murder anything, no questions asked, which is why I don't think he sees quite as much play. Just the sheer reliability of ignoring those imbals and feel no pains really takes the Nightbringer to the next level for me. I've chosen to rate the Void Dragon 9 out of 10, still very solid and an absolutely gorgeous model to boot. Finally, to round out the Catan, we have the Transcendent Catan, providing all the Catan powers on a budget at 270 points rather than 350 or more. This kind of arguably makes him the best Catan defensively, as really the thing that makes them tough to take out is the no more than 3 wounds per phase rule, and if you're getting that for significantly less points, then that's only a good thing. I find the Fractured Personality rule kind of interesting, either pick one or roll for two, but unless you roll and get very lucky, you're generally going to be at a downside compared with some of the others, either having fairly underwhelming melee, or only able to use one power of the Catan per turn, for example. I feel like with Transcendent Catan, you are losing out on a fair bit of damage output on a very pricey model, even if he does cost a bit less, and maybe you just might not be quite on par with the Nightbringer or the Void Dragon. Still though, I think he'd remain a very annoying disruptive unit for fairly cheap points wise, and I've chosen to score him an 8 out of 10. Next up we'll move on to the fast attack section, and here we have the Scarab Swarms for 15 points a model. Canoptic Scarabs tend to appear in virtually every single Necron competitive list, as they fulfil the role of screening, objective grabbing, and being nuisances really well. They're pretty cheap per model, pretty fast at 10 inch movement, and for the points they're very tough indeed, getting 4 toughness 3 wounds on the table for just 15 points is great. They're another one of those models where no matter what you shoot at them, it's not going to be very efficient, whether that's anti-infantry firepower or anti-tank. 
On top of that, they work very well with some of the more competitive dynasties. Their melee output damage can actually be genuinely quite good as Novok, particularly if you combine it with some Technomancer buffs. Or if you go with a custom dynasty, you have the option for Obsec and a pre-game move, which with their fast movement and durability makes them excellent objective snatchers. On top of that, again they work quite well with the Chronomancer, getting a 5 plus invul will make those wounds even harder to shift, and they can also work well with Canoptic Spiders, who can regenerate a base a turn. Their main weakness is, is that they're still not going to kill much, even with their special melee rules, but they still might chew through some light infantry. Overall, I'd say they're one of the most competitive units in the whole codex, and I'd rank them a 10 out of 10. Next up, we have the Fast and Durable Wraiths, 35 points per model, getting you 3 toughness 5 wounds with a 4 plus invul save, and not a model that your opponent's going to be able to ignore as well, as they're pretty fast with 12 inches and moving through enemy models and terrain. Again, they could get a bit more damage output from a Canoptic Control node and a Technomancer, and they can also fall back and charge, meaning that your opponent can't just tie these up with chaff units. On the downsides, I'd say that their melee damage is okay, but not particularly outstanding. Hitting on fours really quite hurt them in the change to the new book, but they'll still go through elite infantry fairly well with a flurry of attacks. I'd say maybe the main weakness of the Wraiths is that they are slightly outshone by other options. Maybe for Shock Assault things, things like Scorpet Destroyers, Lich Guard or Triarch Praetorians, which can all take advantage of synergies a little bit better. Next up we come to the Ophidian Destroyers. Again, 35 points per model, but quite different in setup to the Wraiths. Again, they're fast moving melee critters with a flurry of damage to attacks, but these guys go all in for damage dealing, as opposed to being durable and hard to shift. The Ophidians do have a few advantages, they have built in Deep Strike, get minus 1 to hit in melee, and have fairly hard hitting generalist combat with AP minus 3 damage, and can get a really big buff from a plasma site, which is meaningful for taking them up from strength 4 to strength 5. The downside for these guys is that they're very fragile indeed, only 3 wounds, toughness 4 and a 4 plus save, far easier to kill than wraiths or scorpec destroyers. I think this just really is their undoing to be honest, and for the points they really are quite easy to kill, and maybe not quite hard hitting and devastating enough to justify that fragility. I don't really think that they're a massively bad unit, I just think that they don't compare well to things like Scorpex or Wraiths. I've chosen to rank them a 7 out of 10. Next up we come to the Tomb Blades, between 25 or 38 points per model, depending on how many upgrades that you pile on them. They're a fast moving Necron firepower unit, and I think perhaps their main advantage is they're a core unit that can be really quite fast and hard hitting and can make some of the best use of things like My Will Be Done from Overlords or other core unit buffs. They're quite a flexible unit, being able to choose between three different weapon options, and Shadow Looms and Shield Veins if you want a bit more survivability at a cost, but in general they can be a bit annoying to deal with anyway, as they're minus one to hit at range, can be problematic for some armies. I'd say Tomb Blades are one of the units that you get a fair amount of utility out for the points cost invested, but again just aren't particularly stand out within the Necron Codex. For the points, their speed, damage and durability are all merely good rather than great. Perhaps one of their biggest weaknesses is being tagged in melee as well, which could make a lot of Necron firepower useless if your opponent does have some fast movers. Overall, I'd score the Tomb Blades 8 out of 10. Maybe being a bit generous here, I could have put them happily at 7 as well. The Triarch Praetorians are the last fast attack choice, and these guys are 25 points per model no matter what you equip them with. As to the two, I think that their Rods of the Covenant are quite strong, Strength 5, damage 2, shooting and melee really isn't bad when it's packed up with decent AP. The Praetorians are fast moving and reasonably sturdy with toughness 5 and 2 wounds, and are a particularly popular choice in any list that includes the Silent King, as he can give them absolutely maximal buffs, and also combos well with big heart hitting melee units like these, as he makes enemies nearby fight last. In terms of downsides, they do lack invul saves, so aren't quite as all round sturdy and durable as Lich Guard for example. And as dynastic agents, you don't get any sort of dynastic codes or things with them, they're very much as they are. However, I do think that the combo of fast movement, general purpose hard hitting melee, and at least reasonable durability certainly gets them there. They seem to be a very common sight in lists alongside the Silent King, and I'd rank them a 9 out of 10. Moving on to the heavy support now, and we'll start out with the Annihilation Barge. This hovering gun platform is 120 or 125 points and strikes out with its big twin Tesla Destructor for 10 strength 7 AP 0 shots. I think the biggest advantages of this thing is that it's fairly cheap, does pump out a fair amount of anti-infantry firepower, it's got quantum shielding, and it works quite well with Mephrit who can give them some AP. The AP 0 on the Tesla Destructor can otherwise just be really underwhelming against certain armies, things like Custodes or Space Marines. I would say that in general that is probably its biggest weakness, it could easily be ignored in some games, as its damage output just isn't quite going to get it there. 
Overall, I'd score it a 7 out of 10. If you need a bit more anti-infantry firepower on the list, it's not the worst thing in the world. Though again, for the points cost, I don't think it's enormously standout. Moving on, we come to the Canoptic Doomstalker, the 140-point War of the Worlds Walker, a 48-inch version of the one on the Doomsday Arc, with D6 shots, Strength 10, AP-5, and D6 damage. It does add up to solid enough anti-tank at range, it gets some free overwatch on its data sheets, and can even overwatch against things that are charging nearby enemy units. A battery of these could potentially work quite well with a Canoptic Control Node Cryptek to allow them to hit on threes. As for weaknesses, much like the Doomsday Arc itself, the damage output is very swingy indeed. D6 shots on the main gun means that you could easily get 6, but you could easily get 1 shot and miss it. Ballistic skill 4 is a bit vulnerable to modifiers, and generally it needs to stay still, otherwise it's going to be firing on a very reduced profile. Overall, for a gunline anti-tank unit, I'd say it's one of the Necron's best options, and I'd score it 8 out of 10, but the raw power and damage output of the main cannon does come with some significant downsides. In a very similar story, we have the Doomsday Arc, 190 points per model, and it shares a lot of strengths and weaknesses with the Doomstalker. The anti-tank fire is solid enough, it hits on 3s rather than 4s, which is an advantage. It has a nice secondary weapon in that big battery of Gauss Flares, and if it does need to move and deploy those Gauss Flares where it needs to, it can actually go quite quickly. A large amount of wounds plus quantum shielding and quantum deflection should in theory keep it safe, and having quite a large profile on the model can actually be kind of handy for drawing lines of sight. Again, much like the Doomstalker, the damage is very swingy indeed, and it needs to stay still, which is a significant weakness for a firepower unit in 9th. Overall, I could quite happily take either Doomstalkers or Doomsday Arcs, they both have cool abilities, and for the points, I think you get a very similar amount of utility out of them. I'd score this guy an 8 out of 10. Moving on, we come to the Locust Destroyers. Your standard issue destroyers will cost you 55 points per model, and pack some nice general purpose Gauss firepower at heavy 3, strength 6, AP minus 3, and damage D3. It's a pretty nice generalist profile that's going to be particularly good at hunting space marines, and they're fairly mobile as well, able to move and shoot heavy weapons for no penalty, and moving 8 inches with fly. In particular, their damage output will get so much stronger if you use extermination protocols on them, 2 CP to allow you to re-roll the wound roll with those guns, meaning that you should be wounding anything in the game fairly reliably, even if it's toughness 7 or 8. The downside with the Locust and the Locust Heavy Destroyer is that they're fairly fragile at 3 wounds and toughness 5. For 55 points, that really isn't all that much, to be honest, and it's a bit unhelpful that the standard Gauss cannons are only 24 inch range. It does mean that they have to get at least somewhat close to the enemy to be able to unload their firepower. Overall, I'd say that they're okay, but their fragility stops them from being really outstanding within the Necron list. Of course, we also have their bigger brothers, the Locust Heavy Destroyers, with their Enmiting Exterminators and Gauss Destructors. They're 70 point models in squadrons of 1 to 3, and out of the two, I do prefer the Gauss Destructor over the Exterminator. You do have the potential for a fairly ludicrous 3d3 damage if you do manage to get a wound through with its Strength 10 AP-4 profile. In particular, I think that these single shots work very well with the Zarakan Dynasty. Single Locust Heavy Destroyers will get to re-roll the wound roll on that crazily powerful shot, and just give you a little bit more reliability as to getting that mad damage through. Unfortunately, again, I think they suffer from the same problem as the Locust Destroyers, in that for the points, they're really quite fragile indeed. Only 4 wounds at toughness 5 and a 3 plus save just really isn't all that impressive for 70 points, and you could easily have a single last cannon shot ruin your day if you get unlucky. I rank them fairly similar to the Locust, maybe a little bit stronger than them on average, but I've chosen to rank them 7 out of 10. Moving on to the Necron Flyers now, the Doomside is a 200 point model, packing the decently murderous Heavy Death Ray, firing at Heavy 3, Strength 12, AP-4, and damage D3 plus 3. It also gets a Twin Tesla Destructor, the same as the Annihilation Barge, for a little bit of anti-infantry shooting as well. The main advantage of the Doomside for an anti-tank choice is that it has excellent mobility, you can throw it straight into the opponent's backfield, and you'll be able to get lines of sight on things that you otherwise might not be able to with others of your gunline units. I think its damage output for the cost is fairly reasonable, you could both chip away at infantry, and if you roll well, you could be killing vehicles in a single turn with that death ray. The main downside is that it does cost a fair amount of investment, and it's not really all that hard to kill for the points. Even at minus 1 to hit, 12 wounds at toughness 6 isn't too tricky to get through, and you do have the potential to lose quite a lot of flyer really quite quickly. I've chosen to rank it 7 out of 10, they don't tend to appear very much in competitive lists, but I still think that they're not particularly far behind as usable units. Moving on, we have the Night Scythe, 145 points for essentially a flying transport. 
of 145 points per model, still get that twin Tesla destructor and have the advantage of a very big transport capacity where you can put up to 20 models if you wish. Having good flyer movement means that they can usually get their cargo near where they need to, but I think often tend to get overlooked for the ghost arc just for the extra survivability and close range firepower that it can bring. I'd say perhaps the most interesting attribute about the Night Scythe is the prismatic dimensional breach stratagem. Essentially, if you put a unit in strategic reserve, you could near enough guarantee a charge out of there and get a melee unit straight into combat. You can basically set up the unit within three inches of the Night Scythe, but not have to worry about being too close to enemy models. I do like the stratagem, but it does have a few costs. You'd have to spend the CP for the stratagem and to put the unit into strategic reserve in the first place, and you also can't use the stratagem turn one so you can't use it to get an alpha strike on the enemy army. Could potentially be unhelpful, as your opponent might be able to destroy the Night Scythe by then, as again, like the Doom Scythe, it isn't enormously tough for the points, being only tough in a 6 with no quantum shielding. Also, its damage output isn't all that reliable either, and I think between the lot, it does tend to leave this thing being overlooked in favour of the Ghost Arc. Overall, I'd rate this thing around about a 6 or 7 out of 10. In general, the main reason I'd want to use it, though, will be trying to deliver a combat unit via the Dimensional Breach Stratagem. Moving on, let's talk about the Lord of War choices, and we'll start out with the Monolith, a somewhat recent addition moved over from the heavy support. The Monoliths are 360 points per model, and are fairly sturdy with toughness 8, 24 wounds and a 2 plus armor save. They don't have an invul though, so can be a bit susceptible to really high AP weapons. In general, for the points, I'd say the firepower is fairly okay. The particle whip is likely to do damage against most things, and you can either take it off for anti-infantry or anti-vehicle purposes, depending on what you give the side armaments. Surprisingly enough, for what looks like a floating portal, it's fairly decent in melee as well. That portal of exile should hoover up at least a fair few infantry in combat with it, and can even threaten heavies. Finally, it can act as a bit of a portal for Necron troops, using its Eternity Gate to bring on troops from Strategic Reserve, or using Prismatic Breach again to get some very close charges off. To be honest, I think that the Monolith isn't really all that bad a unit, it mainly just suffers from being in the Lord of War choice. It means that if you're taking one, you need to pay three command points and give up your dynastic codes, and if you take three, you're going very, very heavy on them, and you're going to be spending six command points for the privilege. In addition, Titanic means that it doesn't have amazing use of cover, and it doesn't have the fly keyword anymore, just making it perhaps a little bit easier to move rock than it was previously. Overall, I'd score the Monolith a 7 out of 10, reasonably solid for what it brings for the points, but likely to get overlooked for other options, being a Lord of War. Next up we have the Obelisk, which I think is trying quite hard to be the worst unit in the Necron Codex. It's 10 points more than the Monolith at 370, and is arguably just a little bit more durable, as it has more wounds, and fires out a fair amount of Tesla fire with those Tesla spheres, getting more shots if it stays still. Finally, it has a signature Gravity Well ability, which allows you to slow one nearby fly unit, though to be honest, for the sheer amount of points invested, it feels really quite underwhelming. It suffers from all the same Lord of War problems as the Monolith, big command point taxes and no codes, but compared with the Monolith, the damage output is just flat out bad. The shooting is short range, far worse if moving, and even with quite a lot of shots, it's going to be underwhelming when it's all AP0. Overall, I would say that the Obelisk is one of the worst units in the Necron Codex. I've chosen to give it a 4 out of 10. Next, we have its opened up brother, the Tesseract Vault. This one far more pricey than the other two, at 500 points per model. Like the others, again it is incredibly durable, it loses toughness 8 for toughness 7, but still retains that 2 plus armor save, and gains a 4 plus invul to boot. The 4 plus invul will mean it's far more resilient against anti-tank weapons. It is going to be a bit of a nightmare to shift this thing. Again, it has a little bit of Tesla shooting, like the obelisk, but for the additional points you actually get quite a lot of damage output, as you get to access 3 boosted powers of the Catan, all of which have the ability to throw around a solid amount of mortal wounds, depending on exactly which ones you choose. Again, it has the Lord of War disadvantages like the rest, potentially has the power to do quite a lot of damage to your own army as it explodes on a 4 plus with a very decent explosion. It costs a lot of points at 500 points, and it can't fall back and use Catan powers, making it a bit less flexible. I would also bear in mind that these things are really quite hard to transport physically. They're both enormous and not particularly sturdy models. Overall, I've scored the Tesseract Vault a 6 out of 10, a very big and annoying threat, though I don't think it's particularly outstanding for the 500 points that you pay. Finally, for the Lords of War, though, we end on a very positive note with the commander of the Necrons, the Silent King. His 450 points is really quite easy to include in a list compared with the other Lord of Wars, as you can take him in a Supreme Command detachment and have the command points refunded. He crops up in a lot of Necron competitive lists, and he adds quite a lot of boost to the army. It's reasonably tough, at toughness 7 and a 4 plus invul, and loads of wounds, 
He's got some scary long range damage 6 shooting from those Maneers and can chip away a little bit with his staff and one of his Phaerons. He grants incredibly powerful buffs to nearby units, both hitting better with my will be done, be rolling shooting hits and be rolling melee wounds. Allows for some command protocol manipulation, allowing you to use the same one twice and potentially change up the order of them in game if you need to. He has a psychic denial. And perhaps the single most scary thing about him is that he is really quite powerful in melee and also has an aura of fighting last with enemy units in engagement range. Those obeisance generators basically means that whatever he tags will be fighting last in melee, which means that you have a good chance to kill it first, either with him or with other nearby Necron melee units. He pairs really quite well with Triarch Praetorians or Lich Guard because of this. Overall, he just brings all manner of different advantages to the army and is a solid centerpiece to have moving up the centre of the board. In terms of weaknesses, it's more than you've got a lot of eggs in one basket. He's fairly durable for the points, though not absolutely excessively, I'd say. And seeing as you've tied up quite so many points in one model, he does have a little bit of a risk of being screened or move blocked, and maybe being out of the game for a turn or two if your opponent has some chaff. Still though, I think there's good reason why he's run quite so often. I'd score him a 10 out of 10, a very, very competitive Necron choice. Next we come to the Necron Fortification, the Convergence of Dominion, 120 points for these three beacons, which provide a number of small buffs to the Necron army. As advantages, they really are quite cheap, and they're very easy to include in a fortification detachment, as it doesn't cost any more command points when it's the same as your main faction. For the points, there are very few things that are quite good durability in 40k as these, 120 points for a crazy 30 wounds at toughness 8, means that your opponent just really can't afford to target these most of the time. The main issue is what they actually tend to do though. They only have a few small functions, they do provide leadership and command protocols to nearby Necrons, which is handy, and they've got a small close range shooting attack in their transdimensional abductor. I think their main problem is they just don't really do all that much offensively to help your army. As fortifications as well, they will struggle to set up as per the current 9th edition terrain rules, they can't set up within 3 inches of any terrain pieces, and depending on what sort of density board that you're playing, they could be very hard to even put down in the first place. They won't be moving out of your deployment zone unless you teleport them with a cryptek, which does deny him being able to do anything useful for a turn. And immobile units are always a bit of a liability in 40k, you could risk your opponent's units hiding in melee with them, so you're unable to shoot them. Overall though, they could be kind of annoying to fight against, help to lock down the Necron deployment zone, and just generally be a cheap nuisance, so I have scored them 7 out of 10. In the right circumstances, I could see them being used, but with the current fortification setup rules, I think they're unlikely to see any play in competitive lists. Finally, we reach the Necron HQ choices, and we'll start out with a solid winner in the Catacomb Command Barge. This thing can be between 145 and 185 points, and it's kind of a decent upgrade on the standard Overlord, spending a bunch more points to put them in really quite a sturdy vehicle with quantum shielding, and get them some fairly hefty firepower to boot in the form of a Gauss Cannon. There's quite a lot of advantages to the Catacomb Command Barge, it's tough but still has few enough wounds to use Lookout Sir, has fast movement, the Overlord provides my will be done and relentless march, and it could be a place to mount a Resurrection Orb or the Orb of Eternity. The main downside is the points cost, it is a little bit pricey for an HQ slot, you're basically paying a premium so you both get a tough damage dealer and an HQ slot all in one go. In any case though, I think it's a solid pick to lead the Tomb Worlds, I've scored it a 9 out of 10. Staying very positively, we come to the Chronomancer, an 80 point HQ choice, so very cheap to fill the slot, and provides some really handy buffs for what you get. His 5 plus invul and rerolling charges works really well with things like flayed ones, scarabs, or necron warriors, and he even gets a nice shooting attack as well, chipping away each turn with a d3 plus 3 damage anti-tank stave. He has the option for quite a fun choice in the Cantemporal Nanomines, the Cryptek Articana that slows things down, and can be a good option for the Veil of Darkness as well, making one unit very tough, giving it re-roll charges, jumping it to the other side of the board, and then you've put down a very tough unit in your opponent's drop zone, and have a good chance of making a charge out of Deep Strike. As with all Cryptex, he's quite weak in melee, and he's quite fragile if exposed. He is very much a buff character, not supposed to be a fighter, but I think for what you get, he's absolutely excellent. I've scored him a 9 out of 10, a lot of Necron lists tend to use this guy. Moving on, we come to the Plasmancer, a 70 point HQ choice, whose main purpose is to do a little bit of mortal wounds and shooting. His staff will give him d3 shots at strength 7, AP-3 and damage 2, so likely to do a little bit against whatever he shoots at, and he'll average 1.5 mortal wounds at 24 inches each turn as well. Again, he can be a good option for bearing relics and arcana, and he is very cheap. 
My main issue with the Plasmancer is that he provides no innate buffs to the rest of the army, he is literally just a damage bot, and although he should be fairly safe to do that damage each turn, that damage output just isn't really all very exciting. He will chip away at things, but a couple of mortal wounds and a couple of strength 7 shots isn't going to change the world. Overall, I've scored him a 6 out of 10. I don't think that he's truly useless as an HQ, but typically I think that you just get far more value out of the units that upgrade nearby units, and just get them to do more damage or get more durability that way. Sticking with the Cryptex, we have the Psychomancer next, another 70 point HQ choice, who can do a little bit of leadership manipulation, minus 1 leadership and combat attrition at 6 inches. On top of that, if you can roll against their leadership, you can also debuff a unit as well. Sometimes this could be quite meaningful for winning or losing a game, as you can steal obsec off a unit to maybe help flip a primary objective, or stop them doing actions. Again though, he doesn't really do any innate buffs, his shooting is a bit underwhelming with that Abyssal Lance, and like most Cryptex, he only gets the one attack in melee as well. Again, he's cheap, so he doesn't really have to achieve wonders, but I can just see him having several games where he has little to no effect whatsoever. I just don't think that he has the all-round reliability of some of the other buffing Cryptex. Last and one of my other favourite Cryptex, we have the Technomancer, between 75 or 90 points depending on his options, and I would say gives a few more reliable buffs for his points. His rights of reanimation will resurrect dead Necron models, and that could return quite a few points to the board over the course of the game. And then you've either got the option of the Canoptic Cloak, making him faster and giving him vehicle repair, or taking a Canoptic Control node for plus one to hit for nearby Canoptic constructions, both of which could be pretty handy. The Control node does mean that you're going to have to invest in Canoptic units to go around him, but the Cloak could be kind of worth it just literally for that manoeuvrability alone. Again, he really isn't a damage dealer, he's fragile and bad in melee, but again, a pretty solid buffing character, usually going to be an asset at the heart of a Necron battle line. Moving on, we have the Lords of the Tomb Worlds themselves. Here we have the Necron Overlord, a 95 point HQ choice. The generic commander of the faction is a pretty decent mix between fairly useful buffs, some decent melee capacity, and is fairly tanky for a character. My Will Be Done is a solid damage buff, whether it's on Warriors, Lich Guard, or Tomb Blades and Relentless March makes him kind of handy to have around in the middle of a battle line to make everything just that little tiny bit faster. With the War Scythe, he'll at least be a melee threat to most enemy models, though maybe not quite on the same par as some of the fightier characters out of a lot of other factions. He goes some way to making up for that in durability though, with his 4 plus invul, toughness 5, and the stratagem that might save him from death the first time he's killed. He's a good place for using relics and warlord traits, whether that's things like the Novok Blood Scythe, or the Orb of Eternity, which can bring a significant amount of Necron models back from the dead. For weaknesses, I would say that he doesn't compare amazingly well to other armies melee characters, and for the points, I'm not sure he quite brings us quite as much buffing utility as some other Cryptex. He also will be competing against the Catacomb Command Barge, which of course costs a fair bit more, but has better mobility, decent firepower, and massively increased durability with its quantum shielding. I've chosen to rank the Overlord 8 out of 10, a worthy addition to the Necron battle line. Next up, we have his lackey, the generic Necron Lord, a 70 point HQ choice, similar to a Necron Overlord, but minus one in a lot of respects, fewer attacks, fewer wounds, no invul, and not quite as much buffing power. He does have the advantage of being a fair bit cheaper, his Lord's Will buff is a little bit weaker than my Will Be Done, but still not bad for the points, and he also provides Relentless March. If you're looking for a cop price Overlord, then this guy could get you there. He can provide a little bit of melee damage and can take a resurrection orb too, but I think for the points he's not quite as strong as the Overlord, and I think he'd be a secondary pick after you've already got one of those. I've chosen to rank him a 7 out of 10, not terrible, though not massively standout. Next up we come to the Royal Warden, which I did write 7 out of 10 here when I made the slide, but to be honest on reflection I'd upgrade him to an 8 out of 10. He's an HQ choice, 75 points per model. Pretty cheap, provides relentless march and command protocols, and is mainly there just to provide his one key buff, allowing one unit to fall back and shoot and charge. He's got a little bit of damage output with that Relic Gauss Blaster, it allows him to contribute, though he's never going to achieve all that much by himself. I'd say that his buff only makes sense to be in certain armies, not in all of them. I think he's most valuable when you're running things like big 20-man Necron Warrior blobs, things that could easily get tagged in melee, and then lose a serious amount of damage output because of that. I'm not sure if he's necessarily going to be relevant against every army and every matchup though. To actually get any use out of his buffs, you're going to be in a melee that you don't want to be in, so it's not quite as useful against mainly shooty armies, and it's not always going to be all that helpful for melee Necron armies, as they'll often want to just remain in melee with that unit. In addition, he doesn't have any melee close combat, and he's not got an invul, so it isn't all that hard to kill. 
In general though, I do think that he's a useful piece in making a big blob warrior squad work. It's more a sort of an ability that you want just within the battle line, so if the enemy does happen to engage you, then you're still going to get a lot of damage out of your warriors and not have it ruined. For that reason, I've chosen to rank him an 8 out of 10, maybe a little bit niche in where you'd want to take him, but I think he absolutely makes sense if you are going to be using a few big blocks of Necron warriors marching forward. Next up, we come to the Scorpec Lord, a very fighty HQ choice for 130 points, and pretty much made to run alongside the Scorpec Destroyers with a helpful buff and some scary melee capability of his own. He's got a fair bit going for him for that price tag, he's fairly quick, he's pretty tough to take down with 6 wounds at toughness 6 and a nice 4 plus invul, destructive melee with a choice of anti-armor or anti-infantry abilities, buffs nearby destroyers with his reroll aura, and can also use the 1 CP whirling onslaught stratagem to make him significantly tougher against small arms. He also does have a little bit of ranged damage output too, which isn't too bad. The main downside for him is that he is just a little bit pricey, and for the points cost the buff that he gives isn't really all that amazing. I think he's just maybe a little bit of a niche pick, where I think that you're going to have to get value out of both his buffing power and his melee power within a game to actually make him worth it, compared with just taking more scoreback destroyers. Overall, I've chosen to rank him an 8 out of 10. I think he's perfectly usable if he does have the right units to buff. Next up, we come to the Locust Lord, an 105 point base model, and in a lot of ways is fairly similar to the Scorpec Lord. He's similarly tough, fairly quick and has fly, buffs nearby destroyers, and again hits with some solid melee with his War Scythe. One advantage over the Scorpec Lord is that he can take a Resurrection Orb, which could be an option if you wanted to run one within the army. I feel like this guy is actually fairly similar power to the Scorpec Lord. The Scorpec Lord costs a little bit more, and he gets some significant buffs to his range and melee damage. I think that maybe this guy just gets overlooked a bit compared with the Scorpet Lord and the regular Overlord, who isn't quite as niche in only buffing destroyers. I've chosen to rank this guy a 7 out of 10. In reality though, I think he's at least fairly similar in power to the Scorpec Lord. I could happily take one over the other. Finally, we'll finish off with the Necron unique characters, of which we have 7. I'll be honest, just as a whole, I do think that they bring some interesting tricks, but for the most part, I tend to prefer the generic options. The only unique Necron character that I'd really be tempted to run would be the Silent King. In any case, Anrakir is a 140 point model. He's an upgraded Overlord with a Warside and Tachyon Arrow, and his unique abilities are a plus one attack aura, which is good with Lich Guard, and a fun ability where he might be able to take over a weapon on a nearby vehicle. Could be pretty nice if you get hold of, say, an Imperial Knight's Gun or something. I think he's alright, but just not quite as cost efficient as the cheap Overlord at 95 points. The main disadvantage is that he has no flexibility for bearing things like relics or warlord traits. I think in reality the extra 40 or so points just aren't quite worth it for his upgrades. Still though, for a fun and fluffy choice, he's really not all that much below the standard Overlord. I've chosen to rank him 7 out of 10. Next up we come to Illuminor Seras, and his very stylishly redone models where he's harvesting the soul of this guy. He's an 160 point HQ choice. And interestingly for a cryptech, he's both very fast, has good shooting, and solid melee. He can use the Rites of Reanimation ability twice, so you could potentially be standing up quite a few dead Necron models over the course of the game. And of course he can augment one Necron squad, maybe making it a unit of Necron warriors or Lich Guard or something, a little bit stronger or tougher. It is a bit random though. On the downside though, these abilities do come at a steep cost, it's quite pricey for Necron HQs, has no invul so isn't all that hard to kill. And to really be efficient, he both has to be making good use of all his buffing abilities, and also get stuck into the enemy in melee. Not terrible, but again the lack of flexibility I just don't think is amazing for 160 points. I've chosen to rank him a 7 out of 10, certainly by no means a terrible character, but again I wouldn't say truly outstanding. Next up we come to Imitate the Stormlord, one of my favourite of the Necron named characters, who's an HQ choice for 145 points. I think compared with the other boosted character overlords, Imatech actually makes out quite well. He's got some pretty reasonable close range shooting, he's very sturdy with 6 wounds and a 2 plus save and an invul, and he's a potentially very solid model to make your warlord, giving you plus 2 command points and also a command point farming warlord trait. That'll certainly add up to a fair few more stratagems to play around with. As a Faeron, he can use my will be done twice, so buff 2 different units at the same time, and again he has potential to do quite a lot of damage with his Lord of the Storm Mortal Wound Strike. Potentially, if you get some good line of sight off, and the enemy has chosen to castle up just a little bit, you could really deal quite a lot of mortal wounds with that. Between this and his command points, he really does get to be a fairly tempting pick over generic overlords. My biggest gripe with him is that his melee is a bit underwhelming at strength 6, he isn't really going to be a beat stick character, and perhaps most importantly, he's unfortunately locked to the Celtec dynasty. That one just really isn't taken all that much in competitive lists, and it means that Imatech isn't either. 
To be honest, I'd say that Imatech is one of the stronger reasons to play Sotek, more so compared with its dynastic code. Overall though, I think that Imatech is really quite solid for the points. Command points, a mortal wound bomb, and double my will be done really isn't bad, and I've chosen to score him an 8 out of 10. Next we come to Nemesaur Zandrek, who I just don't think gets there quite as much I'm afraid. He's an 135 point Sotek dynasty model, so again just might not be seen quite as much because of that. He's similarly sturdy to Imatech, and can use my will be done twice as well. Other than that, the things that he brings are around about a 50% chance of getting one of three buffs. Things like plus one attack could be useful in melee, though it isn't all that reliable of course. Though maybe the single most important reason that you could bring him would be his counter tactics rule, which basically allows him to turn off one stratagem once per game. I'd say this is perhaps the single best reason to take him, it essentially gives you a once per game version of the old agents of Vect, though I think it depends on exactly what sort of stratagems the opponent is using as to whether or not that's really worth bringing this guy along. Maybe turning off a command point reroll for a key failed charge, that could be one of the best options perhaps. On the downsides, his melee is really quite bad, even when compared with Imatex, and he is again locked to the Sotek dynasty. I've chosen to score Nemesaur Zandrek a 6 out of 10, I think he is rarely going to be taken to be honest. Really I'd see taking him as an overlord might be a bit of a tax, just to get that counter tactics once per game ability. Next up we come to Vargard Oberon, an 100 point Necron Lord, and the bodyguard for Nemesaur Zandrek. I'd be comparing him to a standard Necron Lord for a 30 point tax, he's at least fairly good in melee, and fairly sturdy with 6 wounds and a 2 plus armor save. He provides Lord's Will and Relentless March, has a rule that means that he gets to fight even if he gets killed first, and has a couple of abilities around Zandrek, allowing him to teleport to him, and protect him from ranged fire. On the downside, he's got no Invul, which is a shame for a character who does want to get mixed up in melee, he's locked to the Sautet Dynasty again, and he's got no flexibility with relics or warlord traits. Overall, I'd score him a 6 out of 10. For me, a bit more of a fun and fluffy choice. I don't think he's significantly better for the points than a Necron Lord, and lacks the same flexibility for bearing important abilities. Next, we come to Orican the Diviner, a 110 point character, this time mercifully not locked to any dynasty, and he's a unique Chronomancer that provides Chronomancer buffs to any Necron unit. It doesn't just have to be ones of the same dynasty this time, so in theory he could give your Catan Shards reroll charges, or buff things like Triarch Praetorians. He's got a tiny little bit more melee than a standard Chronomancer, and he does get to fight first, and his additional bonus is that he has a chance of becoming empowered towards the end of the battle, where he gets a massive buff to his stat line, and actually becomes quite a good combat character. On the downside, he has no ranged damage, whereas the Chronomancer has a big damage D3 plus 3 shot, which is a lot better. He doesn't have any options for taking relics or cryptic arcana, which is a shame as a chronomancer is usually a really good place to bear those. And just in general, I just don't think he really does that much more than a chronomancer, but costs far more. I would say really the only reason that I'd want to run Orican would be specifically to buff Triarch Praetorian units, as they are a unit that can make good use of both the invul save and re-rolling charges. Overall, I've chosen to score him a 6 out of 10, I think I'd rarely take Orican, and definitely more of a fun and fluffy pick. Finally, lastly, we have Trazin the Infinite, and a 100 point Necron Overlord. Getting my will be done and Relentless March is not lost to any one dynasty, making him a bit easy to take. He has a few buffs, including discounting the extra relic stratagem by one command point, though kind of annoying as he can't actually bear one of those relics himself, meaning that you will need at least a few other characters to make use of that. And he's got a couple of fun, though not massively useful, abilities that allow him to take control of an enemy character when he dies, and potentially causes a mortal wound explosion if he kills an enemy character in melee. The problem with taking over other Necron characters is that he's quite cheap as a character, and even if you just take over a Necron Lord or something, you're not really getting a massive upgrade compared with that model. The mortal wound explosion is good, though to be honest he is going to be quite lucky to kill a character. His melee is only strength 7, AP-1, and damage D3. It's not bad, but I'd hardly say it's very reliable to kill one. A lot of frontline combatants are going to be having 2 plus saves or other powerful defensive abilities. Again, much like all of these, you can't pick and choose relics and warlord traits, which is a massive disadvantage of a lot of these unique Necron characters. Overall, I'd rank Trazin a 6 out of 10, again far more of a fun and fluffy pick, as opposed to a competitive choice right now, I think. So that finally brings us to the end of our roundup of all the Necron units out of their codex. It's been another really big project this one, but I've really enjoyed looking through the book in its entirety. If I've missed anything, or you think there's anything else important to say about the units, please let me know down in the comments, it will be fun to have a read through after. If you'd like to see more videos like this, including plenty of other Necron content as the year goes on, 
feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. Finally, if you'd like to help keep on supporting projects like this, I'd just like to mention that the channel has a Patreon page, which is what allows me to spend quite so much time making videos about model soldiers. Big unit comparison ones like this literally take days to make, so if you do enjoy this sort of thing, then any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do tend to have a few advantages, such as seeing certain new videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry to the regular prize giveaways, with a chance to win some big model kits every month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.